Well, good morning. Well, thank God that Jesus Christ never changes. Amen? And um, thank God that we do change because of him. And so I'm excited to be able to be here and uh, share my testimony because my life has changed a lot. And hopefully you guys will be able to learn from that. Um, but first of all, it's always important for me anyways to get to know my audience. You know, I know you guys are Cedar, here at Cedarville and everything. And football is a big deal uh, across our country, that's for sure. It's on every single night of the week, I think. I even get tired of it. And I'm, maybe some of you guys do too. Um, but here's what I want to find out is who's in the crowd. So here's the test. OH. <laughs> Woo. We are. We got the loudest fans at least. OH. <laughs> See, they needed two times to do it. We only need one. So I know we got a lot of Ohio State fans in here, and that's okay. Um, I'm from Ohio. I'm actually from just a, maybe an hour from here, a couple hours from Columbus. That's where I live in Columbus, Ohio now. I'll go into why we live there. It's not because of the Buckeyes, that's for sure. I didn't move there because I'm a Buckeyes fan. Um, you know, I grew up a big time college football fan and uh, wanted to go play college football. That was my number one goal and started getting recruited because uh, somebody uh, at our, you, actually you guys probably know, Bobby Hoing, is anybody, well maybe not. He played before you guys were born, but Bobby Hoing was one of the best quarterbacks that ever played at Ohio State, and um, he went to the same high school as I did. We only had 39 guys on our team. Five of us seniors went on to play college football, and he was getting recruited, and so I started getting recruited a uh, little bit by Ohio State, a lot by other teams, especially Penn State, so I had a great opportunity to go play for Joe Paterno. Um, a lot of you guys probably know him. He died several years ago, was one of the greatest college coaches um, that ever coached. And they had won a couple national titles, so I was excited to go there. And uh, real close to the end of uh, the recruiting process, I was out in our, I grew up on a farm, and um, I was out in our barn doing some work. And uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that I was doing was one of the things I liked doing the least, which was shoveling manure. And I've been asked a lot of times, you know, why didn't you go to Ohio State University? As a matter of fact, every single time I see an Ohio State fan, it seems like they ask me that question, as if, you know, everybody should go to Ohio State University. So I tell them the story. I say, well, this is why. Because I was out in the barn, I'm shoveling manure, okay? And it's like, it's dark, 6 o'clock, whatever, I'm doing my chores. And it's the night before signing. And, and I've kind of already decided where, I'm, where I was going to be going. And lo and behold, my mom comes to the door. And she yells across the barn, you know, maybe 50 feet or whatever. She says, hey, Jeff, Ohio State University is here to talk to you. And I was like, who? Ohio State University. She says, they want to come in and talk to you and offer you a scholarship. And so I looked down at the manure. I looked up. I looked down at the manure again. And I said, Forget about it. I'd rather shovel manure than go to Ohio State. That's my story. Almost a true story. I was in the barn doing chores, shoveling manure, and I didn't go talk to Ohio State University because I had already decided to go to Penn State and I was not an Ohio State fan. So that's my Ohio State story. Hey, um, I recently became the head coach uh, you know, a little bit about me. You'll hear a lot about me in my testimony. Um, but, you know, I, I'm married. And, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting when I became the head coach of Worthing Christian U uh, University, Worthing Christian High School, not that big of a deal, really, becoming a coach. I didn't think it was, you know. It was, but I was excited about it, definitely excited about the opportunity to, um, to do ministry through football coaching, which is what I really love. I love football, love football coaching. So I was really excited about that. Um, but I'll tell you what, one of the things that I realized right away was my name changed. I couldn't believe every single time I taught, I mean, like, it was like instantly. I had, my kids have been going to this school for two years, and I was Jeff or Mr. Hardings, and now all of a sudden I was coach. That was real interesting, you know, Coach Hardings, everybody, parents, and I had to start telling parents, I'm like, please, stop calling me coach. Um, but, you know, that was one of my name changes. I became married uh, about 22 years ago, not about, it's been 22 years ago, and um, <laughs> Act 22 years this May, actually, so we're in our 22nd year, um, and 
you know, I got married. My name was Jeff. Not long after that, my name was Alan. You ask me, why was my name Alan? Well, that's my middle name. So all you men out here, when you get married, she's going to call you your first name until you stop responding. And then she starts calling you your middle name and hopefully nothing else. I'm happy to be just Alan. And, but that's what she gets, gets, gets me to respond. And um, so that was great. And then I became a father. And of course, I became dad. And Sierra, she goes to school here. She's my oldest of eight children. And, um, you know, we're, you, you know, why eight children? I don't know. You know, I'll share a little bit of that. You know, you just have one, then you have another, then you adopt one. Before you know it, you have eight. And you're like, what did we just do? And you're driving a 15-passenger van <laughs> instead of the convertible you'd maybe like to drive or whatever, you know. So that's what I drive to work. And it's only, it's one of a kind, that's for sure. In all of Columbus, I've only seen one silver bullet, 15-passenger van. I, I wish there were more, and I'm only going to drive it until I no longer have to. In about three years, and I don't have all these children going to school. Um, but, you know, I really want to get into my testimony. Um, having become the head coach, this is what, uh, having become the head coach this past year, first time, and you want to have kind of a motto for your program or the season or whatever. And uh, one thing that the Lord really did speak to me was the idea of the process is the product. And uh, as I was praying about what to share today, um, that really came back to me over and over and over again, um, not just because it was the football season, but because I feel like uh, that's what I've really learned in, in my relationship with God uh, through Jesus Christ, is that there's a process. And so through my testimony, I'm hoping that um, you guys will be able to learn a process for yourselves in your relationship with God. And for me, it's trusting God, it's uh, seeking God, it's listening to God, and it's obeying God. And ultimately, what I want to do at, uh, at the end of my days is to be able to um, please God and that he would say, well done, good and faithful servant. And um, so uh, hopefully you guys can uh, get, get that uh, from uh, my testimony. I've had, a, you know, in the game of football, um, there's a lot of game-changing moments um, that really redirect the game. Um, you know, the Penn State-Ohio State game, there was one, there was a blocked punt. Last year, it was a blocked field goal for us. This year, it was a blocked punt, game-changing plays, if you will. And they happen all the time, and they happen in our lives, and they've happened uh, with me. So um, I'm looking forward to sharing some of those um, with you. Um, so, so with that, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a very small town like this, small town that you guys are in. You know, one gas station, one stoplight, one church, and... Um, one school, 100, 100 uh, people in my class, students in my class, maybe not even that many in, um, in a lot of the other classes. Um, but um, we love sports. Uh, you know, my area, this week is the high school football playoffs, and there's always one, two, or three teams from my conference playing for the state championship. Um, we're very obsessed with sports. My family, very obsessed with football, very obsessed with Notre Dame football. At the time, as a matter of fact, might, I'm not even a Notre Dame fan anymore. I'm indifferent to Notre Dame. I, you know, obviously I haven't gone to Penn State, but a lot of my family members are still big Notre Dame fans. So I really grew up playing football in the backyard. You know, we're, we, today we're concerned about kids playing tackle football with pads on. Nobody was concerned about playing tackle football without pads on at my family gatherings of 60. I had uh, 50 cousins. So from the time that I was born, until the time, that's only on one side, by the way. So when I'd go to the Hardings reunion, there was 50. You know, there was always somebody to play tackle. There was never even any mention of playing flag football. When I was six years old, running around with 12 years old, or 12 years old, running around with 18 years old, I mean, I can remember getting totally, you know, plastered, if you will, as a little, you know, 10-year-old. There, there was no mercy. So I grew up very, very competitive and um, very, very, very much in love with football. I loved football, and about you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, started watching a lot of football, started seeing how much money they were making, and I grew up with only the bare essentials. Never did my parents, never did we not have food, never felt that way, um, never did we not have clothing, but only the bare essential clothing, you know, one pair of shoes. Some, some of the older people in here can relate. You, the millennials can't relate because you guys probably have much more than we have, which is fine. But, um, you know, a couple pair of jeans for school. I mean, 
uh, really never, the best way to put it is never really got anything that I wanted. You know, if I wanted this, basically the answer was like, we can't afford that. We can't afford that. We can't afford that. So I, I've basically got into this mode of thinking money equals happiness. Maybe I didn't see my parents happy. Maybe I didn't see my mom happy. I know I wasn't happy because I, wasn't ha- I didn't have the things that a lot of my friends had. And so for me, money was going to equal happiness. And uh, when I was 16 years old, I started playing high school football and was pretty decent. When I was a junior, I realized, wow, I, you know, I got some pretty good talent. And at that time, somebody from my town actually made it to the NFL, actually was drafted in the first round. Up to that point, no social media. I can't relate to you guys. <laughs> you guys can't relate to me probably. So no cable TV in my house, no social media. I'm just in my little vacuum in my small town. I'm really thinking like there's Goliaths at all these other co- high schools in America. There's no way that I could go play Division I college football, much less make the NFL, until Jim Lachey went to Ohio State University. Some, I see some heads shaking. Jim Lachey from my town went to Ohio State University and was drafted in the first round, San Diego Chargers, five years, $5 million. And I was like, wow. At that point, the lottery had just started in America, pretty much. And to win a million dollars in the lottery was a big deal. Now, it's like 800 million. I don't know, I don't play the lottery. <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't, if you do, you do. You know, it's probably not a very good use of your money. But, you know, sometimes people are winning 300 million, 400 million. Man, I was just dreaming that I could be a millionaire and that would last me the rest of my life and I could be happy. My uh, family could be happy. I'd be able to make my wife happy. Um, And um, football was going to be the ticket to make that happen. And uh, so I poured all my effort and all my energy and all of my main focus into that. Now, don't get me wrong. I went to school, I cared about school, I was not going to college for school, I was going to college for football. You know, that's just a fact. Uh, Thankfully, I was blessed with uh, some pretty good smarts and I could get through school pretty easily, Um, but football was my main, main focus. And um, by the time I was a senior, I was all state, uh, went and played in an all-star game, was able to go to Penn State University, and, um, and I was very intimidated. I was going there with no accolades nationally, And I had the number one recruiting class in America going to Penn State University. 25 guys, I was probably the 25th guy to get offered a scholarship. Um, But I quickly realized actually that I had a lot of, I had a lot of talent, uh, good enough talent, wasn't big enough, but I was very competitive. And um, so I was working out six days a week and, uh, but hit a bump in the road my first year, actually had to red shirt because my knee was, uh, I tore some meniscus in my knee. But my second year, I was already playing. And that Notre Dame University that I loved so much, and like I literally cried because we lost, and my dad literally threw newspapers at the TV because, because of bad plays and lost and probably cussed and everything else. Um, I was going into, I was driving up to Notre Dame as a freshman at Penn State University playing against Jerome Bettis. Come on, Jerome Bettis. Rick Meyer, I mean, they had like five, six, seven NFL players, and um, it, was, it was just a surreal moment for me, and um, I quickly realized, like I said, I was able to play some pretty good football and became a two-time All-American, and because of that, and my talent, obviously, I was going to be a pretty high draft pick in the 1995 draft, actually 1996 draft, finished uh, Penn State University in 1995, had a lot of success, won a Big Ten title, went undefeated, and now I was going on to uh, be drafted by the Detroit Lions and um, be able to realize my dream, my dream of playing in the NFL. But really a big part of that was my dream to become becoming a millionaire. And uh, ironically, I got a five-year, $5 million contract because I was a first-round draft pick. Ten years after, Jim Lachey had received the same same contract. And um, things changed a lot. You know, now, you know, I, I can remember right after I got drafted, some, one of my buddies from college, he stay in touch with them. And I was calling him. He's like, man, almighty, what's it like? And I was like, well, let me think. When I go to the gas station, I don't think about having money to put gas in the tank. I fill it up. <laughs> you know, that was a big difference. When I want to order pizza, I order pizza. You know, this was, I was going from a guy who had no money to having a lot of money. 
And so I expected, you know, things to be very good for me. Um, got married very much shortly after that. And um, through the course of actually um, dating in high school, I had actually broken up with my present day wife because of football, because I kind of felt like she was getting in the way of my focus on football. And, um, and then, why are you laughing? You shouldn't laugh at that. <laughs> You're the first group that's laughed at that. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Well, I'll find out here maybe. But it's not a fun, my wife does not think it's funny and this is streamed and she's probably watching this. So you're lucky she's not here. She didn't think it was funny when I broke up on Thanksgiving day, I don't know, 24, day, 24 years ago. Cause I was playing in the state high school championship the next day and I was like enough. I'm focusing on football. I guess this is a good time to break up, you know, st stupid high schoolers. That's why, I that's why I told my daughter, you're not dating anybody in high school. High school boys are idiots. They're not thinking about girls. They're thinking about way too, yeah, give it a shit, yeah. Maybe I was just the idiot, I don't know. I, I was an idiot. Thank God that three years, three years later, I was able to get back together with her and you know, she would, sometimes I'd tell her, you were an idiot for getting back together with me. But I'm a work in progress, but, but um, anyways, I'm, I'm married. And I'm thinking, you know, diamond rings, man, you're going to be happy for a while. Well, like 12 hours, you know, until I didn't put my shoes away. And, you know, th these are like real live things that are happening to me. You know, diamond tennis bra bracelet for Christmas. It's Christmas time. What are you going to give your wife for Christmas? Well, how about a diamond tennis bracelet? You know, that'll make her happy. Well, for like that day, I mean, it didn't really change that much. And it wasn't really because of her. I mean, the reality is that material things don't make you happy. I mean, they don't really change your, your perspective uh, and, your situ and your circumstances. And I, quite frankly, was not a good husband, period. Um, you know, I kind of felt like eating, you know, eat dinner. Thanks for having dinner ready. I'm going to go watch ESPN, see what's going on in ESPN. You're, you know, you're cleaning up. So it was, we had a constant tension in our marriage. In football, we, I, I was playing for the Detroit Lions. I held out because the contract couldn't get settled. I sign, we lose 10 out of 11 games. <laughs> so having never had a losing season, you know, that became very difficult for me to deal with. Um, I can remember for, you know, after one game, actually literally going to the bathroom and crying as a 25-year-old guy because we lost a football game um, because that's how much that I wanted to win. Um, but now we're losing games. Uh, it didn't get much better the next year. Not only that, the culture of the NFL football is a business. Okay, I mean, we, you understand that it's a business because of the amount of money that's involved, and there was a lot of money involved then too. Um, but understanding that every single day that you go perform, if you will, in your job, you go back and you watch the videotape of it. And you say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. So basically, every single, not every single day, every single day that you practice, you go practice, and then you go home that night, and you know there's five plays that you don't want to see or even more. So basically, you lose sleep every night because you're like, oh, my goodness. Not only am I, I'm going to have to watch it. My buddies are going to have to watch it. I mean, it's fantastic motivation to get better. I will say that. Fantastic. <laughs> because you don't want to have all those plays um, being played um, before um, your peers, your coaches. And not only that, your livelihood is on, at stake. Like, you're literally... On a week in, week, base, week out basis, you're seeing guys get quote unquote fired, I guess. They called it a pink slip. They call it, you know, the general manager will walk down and ask somebody to go up and you know the reality is you may or may not see him back because, um, because he either wasn't performing or somebody got injured. And then a lot of those guys, you would realize they never make it back to the NFL. So it's a very, very stressful uh, livelihood on top of the fact that you're not winning. Um, I had went to church a lot. You know, throughout my, um, as a matter of fact, until I left, until I was able to drive, I went to, went to church every Sunday. Then when I was able to drive, I went to church, grabbed a bulletin, and brought it home after I went to McDonald's to eat um, on a regular basis. So, you know, God wasn't really that relevant except, you know, praying that I'd make it to the NFL. And in college, it kind of continued, you know, the same way. You know, he was kind of like a lucky rabbit's foot and wanting to, you know, help me to feel good. I didn't really have a relationship with God, that's for sure. I wouldn't even say I didn't really. I didn't have a relationship with God. Um, I was stressed out, ready to actually quit the NFL because at that point I realized money wasn't making my wife happy. Money wasn't making um, 
it didn't make my mother happy or anybody else around me. And I didn't need the money, so I didn't really care about being in this very stressful living uh, just to provide what I think would be happiness for other people. Um, so I was at the point where I was ready to, to quit football. I was ready to quit my marriage. At one point, I can remember working out with uh, my strength coach, and I was just really irritated, just not focused, and he asked me what was wrong. And um, I said, I said, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm ready to ask for a divorce. I, I'm sick and tired of being married. She's getting in the way, um, constantly nagging me about why I got to work out and all of that stuff. Um, she better be careful what she asks me because if she ever makes me choose between football and her, she's not going to like the answer. And if you know in a weight room, you guys have an exercise room, there's mirrors. And I looked up in the mirror. And like every time I say this, I still get choked up because I remember looking at myself and being like, and, and God, God, you know, even though I didn't have a relationship with God, he's definitely still in us. And I remember at that moment, it wasn't like I really definitely didn't think it was God, but I just remember looking at myself like, wow, I didn't just say that, did I? I knew that there was something wrong with me. And I knew that there was something wrong with me, and it didn't have to be that way because in our locker room, as a matter of fact, in that weight room was somebody, Luther Ellis, and there was something different about him. He had joy. Even, even in the same circumstances that I was living in, he had joy. And the difference was is that he had a relationship with God. And he invited me to a Bible study for the first time in my life. And I remember going into that Bible study, and they opened up the Bible. I had never opened up the Bible before because I was told it was too difficult to understand. Um, and they opened up the Bible, and it was in the book of Philippians. And I don't remember exactly what it was, but the message was so clear to me about living life for something other than our own personal um, enjoyment, our own personal happiness, and looking for other things in order to find that happiness, that, that happiness and joy comes through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And relevant to uh, being an NFL football player, what we were talking about that day was playing for an audience of one, playing for Jesus Christ instead of playing for your own satisfaction, playing for your peers, playing for the millions of people that are watching TV. And that made a big difference in my life, and it just happened to be at the right time for me to hear that message. Uh, the, most simple, <laughs> the most simple illustration of the difference that I felt like God was going to make in my life was an illustration that that pastor made that day about being a husband who loves your wife, and after dinner, you don't get up and go watch ESPN. This is literally what he said. After dinner, you don't get up and go watch ESPN. Help her out with the dishes. And I remember thinking, wow, that's how the Bible applies to my life? I had no idea. I thought it was like I would not be able to understand God, not be able to understand a relationship with Jesus Christ. That made sense to me because in my home, that was one of the tensions that I, that I was having. And on the field, playing for an audience of Jesus Christ is basically just having a great attitude, concentration, and effort. That's what I teach our kids. Ace attitude, concentration, and effort, and let the performance go where it goes. I fumbled snaps all the time, and I can remember one time um, being on the goal line and fumbling a snap, and we lost the ball, and, and I forget if we lost the game or not, but obviously running off Heinz Field, 65,000 people, I know what they think of me, you know, and uh, not to mention the 65 million people, and I, I thought I did everything perfectly, and looking up at the sky and be like, God, why did that happen? But there was a purpose. He cared, he cared about me. And I gave my best effort, and that helped me to be able to play the rest of the game. Um, there was going to be something different about my life. I put my trust in him. It says in 1 Peter, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. I talked about the process for me was first trusting God. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. And for me, having grown up in a church that, that you earned going to heaven, to know that I was going to heaven just because of the trust that I have in Jesus Christ because of what he did for me was a huge difference in my life, it made a huge difference for me. This was a game-changing point in my life. Pascal noted that there is a God-shaped emptiness um, in every person. A lot of you guys have heard this. There was this huge emptiness in me that Jesus Christ came in and, uh, and filled for me. And from that moment forward, I can honestly say I never played football nervous again. Before that, I literally would have to get through the first quarter. 
I would be so nervous, so anxious. The first five plays, I'd literally be feeling like my legs were jelly and ready to you know, fall down. It was very hard to perform that way. After that, I, I was never really that nervous. Case in point, going into the Super Bowl in 2005, fast forward you know, eight years, um, while some players... You know, Heinz Ward tells a story about how, you know, he comes in before we go, it's like a half hour before the game, and he comes in, and, you know, he's puking before the game because of nerves. I'm sitting there with the peace that surpasses all understanding that I can't even understand that whatever happens, happens. Hey, did I pray we would win the game? People ask me. I was like, you bet I prayed we'd win the game. Why did I pray? Because it'd feel a lot better if we won the game. That's why. And this is what I got to show for it. I brought my ring. If anybody wants to, Browns fans, you guys can come down too. I know that you don't know what one feels like or looks like, and, but I admire you. I admire you, because being a Browns fan takes a lot of heart, that's for sure. Um, hey, my life changed. My friends changed. It says in the Bible, these are the kind of things that I've discovered afterwards. I knew that my friends needed to change. My friends were involved in these kind of things. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness. Wild parties, their terrible worship of idols. I mean, that fits me to a T. That's why I'm sharing it. Of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you. Like that verse fits me to a T. That's exactly what happened in 1998 in Detroit. The friends that I was hanging out with, I could no longer hang out with. Um, and I knew that, and I knew I needed to change that. My way of thinking changed. Um, my, some, a couple of the favorite verses that, of, in the Bible for me are Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. You guys know these? And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. When I was originally thinking about what to share with you, that's what it was. The culture that we live in, the dominant culture, and how much Christians live the dominant culture. And you guys live that dominant culture. And I live that dominant culture, which we're not supposed to be copying the customs and behavior of the dominant culture. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. I love that part, by changing the way you think. That's what I had to do. I had to totally change the way I think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. God's will for you. You guys are young. I hope and pray that you're praying on a daily basis of what God's will is for you because I'm sure it's very confusing. <laughs> you're going to college. You're 20 years old. You're 19. You're 21. You're at a Christian school. I don't even know if you want to be here. Do you want to serve God? How do you want to serve God? But I pray you're praying about it because it's, it takes a while to understand that and to be able to listen to him, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And ultimately, um, that's what really my testimony comes down to is wanting to please him. That time in my life was definitely a game changer. I don't have time to share all the ways that he, he, um, he changed my life, but immediately I went about seeking God. I went about asking my pastor, how, what, is it, how, what, what do I do? You know, read the Bible, read the Bible. I came across some passages, a passage in the Bible but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself. I said about to never cuss again. Like, I, I seriously did. 1998, I decided I cussed like left and right. It was just normal to cuss in a locker room. No big deal. I, I read this. I said about, I'm not going to cuss anymore. Um, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. I don't have time to share the whole story, but... The biggest game-changing moment in my life besides my testimony is the fact that we've adopted three children. And not only have we adopted three children, but we adopted three African-American children. I went on, um, became a free agent, and went on to Pittsburgh to the Pittsburgh Steelers, got involved in a ministry for orphans, basically, on the north side of Pittsburgh, a uh, 
uh, working with youth and have raised over probably over $10 million dollars for that organization while I was a Pittsburgh Steeler because of, because of reading this verse and understanding that I was seeking God, I was hearing God, and, and it was very important to listen to God and obey him um, for me. Um, there has been a lot of other um, things that have been uh, obviously important in my life. We moved to Salt Lake City to help plant a church. We moved back to Pittsburgh to help Urban Impact Foundation, and now we moved to Columbus and uh, to be closer to family. And when I did that, all of, uh, through all of those experiences, there was seeking God, there was listening to God, there was trusting God, and there was obeying him and knowing that it doesn't matter where you live, it matters how you live for me. Um, I would just like to close with this. You know, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ went to a garden the night before he was going to be crucified. And um, this has really had a huge and profound impact on my life, too, just kind of thinking about Jesus Christ going to the garden, trusting God, seeking God, listening to him, and speaking to him and saying, he went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I meditate on that verse right there a lot. I want your will to be done, not mine. I think if you meditate on that and wanting to do his will and not yours, you're going to find at the end of your life that you've lived a life that is very pleasing to him. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here to share my testimony, and I pray that it has an impact on um, these students and the people in this room in the same way that other testimonies have impacted me. I thank you for... Um, for their attention today, and, their, and, and um, I pray for them as they uh, seek you, Father God, that they find a place to seek you, that they hear you, that they get used to what your voice sounds like for them, that they listen to you, and most importantly, that they obey you and live a life that is pleasing to you. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.